Long ago in Essos, there was a girl that wanted nothing more than to run and play with the other children. Feel the grass between her toes, feel the safety of her house with the red door, smell the citrus of her lemon tree, and have a simple, happy life. But life would never be simple for her. She was a princess in the blood of the dragon. Life had much different plans for her. Through struggle and abuse and hardship, she managed to hatch three dragons and the chance to make things right, to right the wrongs of her life and so many others. Those three dragons were a gift, but also a curse. In the last episode of Game of Thrones, she unleashed her last child on the city of King's Landing, reducing it to ashes. What happened to that girl who just wanted to run through the fields and play? Why did she choose to unleash fire and blood on the innocents? When did her heart turn to stone? The first thing to look at at why Daenerys burned King's Landing to the ground is who she is and where she came from. To quote Quaith, to go forward, you must go back, and to touch the light, you must pass beneath the shadow. Daenerys was born into a world of death and blood. From the moment she was born, daggers in the dark followed her everywhere, and the powerful sought to exploit her. She was born on Dragonstone, the dormant volcano and seat of her family house Targaryen and their dragons for generations, during an almighty storm that destroyed their fleet. Back in King's Landing, Robert Baratheon, Tywin Lannister, and Ned Stark had dethroned her father, the Mad King Aerys I, and sacked King's Landing. Sir Jorah Mormont was there for that horrible sack and had this to say. I was in King's Landing after the sack, Khaleesi. You know what I saw? Butchery, babies, children, old men, more women rape than you can count. There's a beast in every man, and it stirs when you put a sword in his hand. The only two surviving members of her family, Daenerys and her elder brother Viserys fled Westeros and moved between the free cities just ahead of the assassins and rarely finding any peace. Every gift they received came with a demand, every smile masked greed and plots, and every moment of peace was fleeting. For years, the figure that loomed largest in Danny's life was her older brother Viserys, sometimes called the Beggar King. While in the show, Viserys is forgotten by most of the viewers after his golden crowning at the hands of Khal Drogo, the same is not true for Danny. He was her world, served as her protector, teacher, friend, and parent. Unfortunately, he did pretty poorly on most of those counts. What Danny remembers most of him is the physical and mental abuse, what he called waking the dragon. I am the Lord of the Seven Kingdoms, not some grass-stained savage with bells in her hair. Viserys spat back at her. He grabbed her arm. You forget yourself, slut. Do you think that big belly will protect you if you wake the dragon? His fingers dug into her arm painfully, and for an instant, Danny felt like a child again, quailing in the face of his rage. Viserys was everything to her, the only family she had left in the world, and he repaid that with mental and physical abuse, replacing what should have been love with fear and anger. His treatment of her as her only family and her king are unfortunate examples she has never forgotten. I was alone for a long time, Jorah, all alone, but for my brother. I was such a small, scared thing. Viserys should have protected me, but instead he hurt me and scared me worse. He shouldn't have done that. He wasn't just my brother, he was my king. Why do gods make kings and queens if not to protect those who can't protect themselves? Throughout her life, since claiming her dragons and conquering across Essos to Westeros, much of how she acts and the decisions she makes is as a response to Viserys' cruelty to her. In the books and show, many compare Danny to her father, the Mad King Aerys. She never knew Aerys, though. Jaime Lannister ran him through with his sword before she was even born. She knew Viserys, though. Where he punished the weak and innocent, she tries to help. Where he raged, she tried to show mercy and kindness. Not always. A lot of the rhetoric and threats she uses are directly from Viserys' playbook. Cruel words, threatening to burn and destroy, reminding everyone that she's a descendant of dragon lords and Maegor the Cruel in particular, that she will bring her enemies fire and blood. In A Dance with Dragons, she even begins using his Wake the Dragon line that tormented her throughout her young life. Daenerys pushed her hair back. Find these cowards for me. Find them, so that I might teach the Harpy's sons what it means to wake the dragon. Daenerys is not Viserys, not by a long shot, but she can't stop hearing his taunts and fearing him waking the dragon, no matter how many cities she conquers or how many people love her. For Danny, the Iron Throne is not just 
a chair to sit in, it's a lost destiny. It is a symbol of righting the wrongs of her broken life, and to make sure no one can hurt her the way her brother did ever again. No more daggers in the dark, running from one city to another, always living in constant danger. Everything in her life will be better once she fulfills her destiny and reclaims Westeros and the Iron Throne. She'll be queen, with her dragons by her side. She'll finally have the peace she so desperately wants. Be able to run through the grass again, find her house with the red door. But it was not to be. That night, she dreamt that she was Rhaegar, riding to the trident. But she was mounted on a dragon, not a horse. When she saw the usurper's rebel host across the river, they were armored all in ice. But she bade them a dragon fire, and they melted away like dew, and turned the trident into a torrent. Some small part of her knew that she was dreaming, but another part exulted. This was how it was meant to be. The other was a nightmare, and I have only now awakened. This is also why she reacted so strongly to Jon's claim to the Iron Throne. For Daenerys, it's not about the throne or the power or whose head the crown sits on. It is Danny's dream that is so close to being in her hands and is being pulled out from under her by a surprise nephew. She wants to be under nobody's thumb ever again, to finally escape Viserys' blows. And when she speaks about how people will push you into power and conquest even if you don't want it, she speaks from experience. Just having dragons made her the strongest power in the known world, and that sort of power attracts jealousy and plots. She had to keep conquering or else risk losing everything she had. For all you Harry Potter nerds, it's a bit like the Elder Wand, where you are the most powerful but it puts the biggest target on your back. Danny is warning Jon about going down her own path, that where pushing a claim to the Iron Throne leads you. As many have pointed out though, Daenerys is not the kind of person who normally turns her military might on the innocent, and that is true. She has not ordered the killing of innocents before episode 5 of Game of Thrones The Bells, but she has been talking about doing it for quite a long time, using the same strategy of fear and violence that she learned from Viserys. As Daenerys returns from the murder of the cows in base Dothrak, she finds Marine under heavy siege and Tyrion Lannister and his advisors unable to stop it. Tyrion finds himself in the uncomfortable position of having to talk Daenerys out of her threats against the rest of Slaver's Bay. Do we have a plan? I will crucify the masters. I will set their fleets afire. Kill every last one of their soldiers and return their cities to the dirt. That is my plan. He would have burned every one of his citizens. The loyal ones and the traitors. Every man, woman and child. That's why Jamie killed this him. This is entirely different. We're talking about destroying cities. It's not entirely different. Daenerys largely rules through fear and the threat of her dragons, not unlike previous Targaryen monarchs. Many of the early ones, like Aegon the Conqueror or Maegor the Cruel, actually did kill people by the thousands, and their descendants were able to use these horrific examples of mass death as thinly veiled threats. Jaehaerys I and Queen Alysanne famously flew their dragons into Old Town as a not-so-subtle threat against the Faith of the Seven if their decision on Jaehaerys' marriage did not go the way he wanted. Lord Alaric Stark as well referenced Harrenhal when Alysanne visited Winterfell for the first time on her dragon Silverwing. The freehold of all Valyria did much the same. They destroyed the Roinar civilization so completely that no one has repopulated the broken, burned cities along the River Roin. The same for the Giscari Empire, who were destroyed so completely that they turned to slavery, creating the Slaver's Bay as we know it. Extreme acts of violence and cruelty to put their enemies on notice of what happens when you cross the dragons. You are the blood of the dragon. Dragons plant no trees. Remember that. Remember who you are, what you were made to be. Remember your words. Remember who you are, Daenerys. The dragons know. Do you? Daenerys has done much the same in her time. The sack of Astapor and the mass killing of the masters at the hands of her unsullied served as a warning as she marched on Yunkai and Meereen. The nailing of the masters of Marine to signposts and her feeding more of them to her dragons were much the same. Her style of rule is based around massive threats of violence and death for those who oppose her and kind treatment for those who don't. A sound strategy when you have dragons, and one that is previously mentioned, has been highly effective within the Targaryen dynasty. While they still had their dragons, even weak rulers were able to use the examples of their ancestors to get their way. 
and even within her own time as queen or Khaleesi, she has had the blood of the innocent on her hands too. Following the attempted poisoning by the wine cellar ordered by King Robert, her husband Cal Drogo was so enraged on the attempt that he finally vows to take back the Iron Throne and sack Westeros for his queen. Which Danny is initially pleased by, but less pleased when she sees how that has to happen. In order to pay for the invasion, the Dothraki need ships and money to pay for them to cross the Narrow Sea. And the Dothraki only know one way to acquire money. Sacking towns and cities and selling the inhabitants as slaves. Slaves, Danny thought. Khal Drogo would drive them downriver to one of the towns on Slaver's Bay. She wanted to cry, but she told herself that she must be strong. This is war. This is what it looks like. This is the price of the Iron Throne. Danny is naturally overwhelmed by what she sees and tries to save anyone she can from the Dothraki. The only one she really can is the infamous Miri Mazdur. Danny prides herself on saving Miri and trying to give her a new life after the sack of the Lazarine town. Miri, though, rebukes her pride. I saved you. Saved me? Three of those riders had already raped me before you saved me, girl. I saw my god's house burn. There where I had healed men and women, beyond counting. In the streets I saw piles of heads. The head of a baker who makes my bread. The head of a young boy that I had cured of fever just three moons past. So, tell me again exactly what it was that you saved. And Danny ended up burning Miri on the pyre that birthed her dragons, as a traitor for not returning Drogo to life? A key part of Martin's and the show's framing of Daenerys is that for most of her arc, the people she is burning and killing are often not sympathetic. They're slavers or people that have wronged her in some very clear way. Or, in season 8, literally the undead. In the last few seasons, the show has started taking a turn on showing the people that she's punishing in a more sympathetic light. As mentioned above, Tyrion had to talk her out of burning the cities of Slaver's Bay to the ground with everyone inside. And in addition, last season, rather than clapping random and dick on Tarly in chains to think over their surrender, Daenerys instead turns and burns them alive with Drogon, so as not to seem weak to make an example of them, like she did with Astapor and Marine. An example that she's made many times before, and a strategy that works very well in getting cooperation, as we see, everyone else surrenders instantly. Daenerys has been led up to this point with foreshadowing and examples that she might kill a frightening number of people as an example so her rule will be obeyed. However, the look on her face before she urges Drogon into the air and begins raining fire down on the people of King's Landing is not the cold satisfaction we've seen her use like when she killed the Khals, or fed the masters to her dragons, or destroyed the fleets outside of Marine. On her face, we can see intense rage and conflict and pain as she looks up at the Red Keep and across the city. And then she unleashes fire and blood. For why she did this, I think we can look back at another character, Catelyn Stark. During the Red Wedding, Catelyn is desperate and looking for any way out of the massacre. Not for herself, but for her son Rob. All around her, her friends and family and countrymen are being slaughtered. Rob has been peppered full of arrows, and the only thing she can do in the moment is take a hostage. In the show, she grabs Walder Frey's wife and threatens to open her throat if Rob is not allowed to leave. In the books, she instead grabs the fool Aegon Frey, known as Jingle Bell. A man in dark armor and a pale pink cloak spotted with blood stepped up to Rob. Jamie Lannister sends his regards. He thrust his long sword through her son's heart and twisted. Rob had broken his word, but Catelyn kept hers. She tugged hard on Aegon's hair and sawed at his neck until the blade grated on bone. Blood ran hot over her fingers. His little bells were ringing, ringing, ringing. And the drum went boom, doom, boom. In both cases, Catelyn's last act of life is the death of an innocent for no reason other than to cause pain. Yet for Catelyn, this is an unforeseen development that she would even do this. You might even call the development rushed or a heel turn. Not long before the Red Wedding, Lord Karstark had killed Rob's two Lannister hostages, two boys, as revenge for Jaime killing his own sons. The reason for the killing was because Karstark actually wanted to kill Jaime Lannister, 
As this is pointed out, Catelyn feels intense guilt over the murder of the two innocent boys and the role she played in leading up to it. His words ring against Catelyn's ears, harsh and cruel as the pounding of a war drum. Her throat was dry as bone. I did this. These two boys died so my daughters might live. Lord Karstark looked instead at Catelyn. Tell your mother to look at them, he said. She slew them as much as I. Catelyn put a hand on the back of Rob's seat. The hall seemed to spin about her. She felt as though she might retch. This is not somebody you would expect to turn around and slash the necks of innocent people. Yet, when she is faced with death, loss, and betrayal all around her, Catelyn raked their necks with her knife all the same. This connects back with Danny, that she too has felt these feelings profoundly throughout Season 8. The Battle of Winterfell is a huge source of trauma for Danny. Not only is Sir Jorah killed directly in front of her, her children are in danger as well. Drogon becomes overwhelmed by whites and is forced to abandon Daenerys in the midst of battle, putting her in a fight for her own life. Rhaegal as well is injured during the battle and crashes into the ground, and many fans thought that he might have died. Daenerys was also forced to turn Drogon's flames against her own undead child Viserion in the midst of the Night King's deadly blizzard. And then on top of that, most of her Dothraki army was killed in their ill-advised charge, as well as many of her Unsullied defending the walls. And that is only one episode. Those losses and the terror she felt cannot be overlooked as a major source of trauma and stress on her mind. And in the next episode, she loses much more. Although Roose Bolton delivered the final stab to Rob Stark during the Red Wedding, Rob is actually initially shot full of arrows right in front of Catelyn. Daenerys experiences much the same when Euron Greyjoy's fleet shoots Rhaegal out of the sky with Kyburn's special scorpions. Daenerys has consistently referred to the dragons as her children, so we should in the moment understand that she is undergoing the same pain as Catelyn. Many in the fandom are discounting this profound loss, and the same for Viserion as huge sources of anger and rage for Daenerys, but we shouldn't. They might be dragons, but their losses are as devastating to her as Catelyn and Cersei losing their children. While we know how Cersei reacts to the death of her children with blowing up seps and whatnot, in the books, that moment when Catelyn slits Jingle Bell's throat, she becomes another person that would become known as Lady Stoneheart. I dreamt of a roaring river, and a woman that was a fish. Dead she drifted, with red tears on her cheeks, but when her eyes did open, oh, I woke from terror. Catelyn was raised back into life by Beric Dondarrion, still bearing the wounds of her death, and slightly decomposed by the river her corpse was tossed into, became known throughout the Riverlands as Lady Stoneheart, or Mother Merciless. She took over the Brotherhood Without Banners and began a widespread campaign of revenge and violence against the Lannisters and Freys. Although her reign of terror initially began with just those houses, it quickly spread, and she even put nooses around Brienne of Tarth and Podrick Payne's necks unless they helped her get revenge on Jaime Lannister. Brienne felt the hemp constricting, digging into her skin, jerking her chin upward. Sir Hyle was cursing them eloquently, but not the boy. Podrick never lifted his eyes, not even when his feet were jerked up off the ground. If this is a dream, it's time for me to awaken. If this is real, it's time for me to die. All she could see was Podrick, the noose around his thin neck, his legs twitching. Her mouth opened. Pod was kicking, choking, dying. Brienne sucked the air in desperately, even as the rope was strangling her. Nothing had ever hurt so much. This escalation from somebody who previously would not harm the innocent into bloodlust and revenge is the example that I reach to when I see what Daenerys did to King's Landing. The profound rage, the senseless violence, punishing those who don't deserve their wrath straight out of Lady Stoneheart's playbook. And to pile on, Daenerys additionally watched her best friend Missandei be beheaded right before her eyes on Cersei's order. That's even before we get to the treason by Viverus and John's final rejection of her as his love and potential wife. As the bells of King's Landing ring in her ears, I was reminded of how the Woods Witch Prophet, the Ghost of Highheart, described the Red Wedding. Oh, I dreamt such a clangor that I thought my head might burst. Drums and horns and pipes and screams. But the saddest sound was the little bell. The little bells ringing and the screams and the clangor. In that moment, you can imagine what is running through Danny's mind. The bells ringing like a calls. Missandei's body falling into the dirt. Rhaegal and Viserion being shot from the sky. The sons of the harpy killing Barristan. 
the Whites slaughtering Jorah, and her brother, Viserys, with his golden crown, raising his hand to her as he did so often, shouting at her, Woken the dragon! The words ringing in her ears, along with the death cries of Rhaegal and Viserion. Woken the dragon! Masande shouting, Dracarys. Woken the dragon! And in that moment, Daenerys' heart turned to stone, waking the dragon inside, a dragon of old Valyria and House Targaryen, born amidst the salt and smoke, delivering fire and blood.